Welcome to Burnt Out. The Burnt Out podcast shares the stories of firefighters, emergency personnel, and other first responders around the world to create a pathway to save lives. The stories you will hear are real and may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. And now I'd like to introduce you to your hosts for Burnt Out, Skip O and Jeff, the old guy. Sean, thank you for that introduction. And we'd like to thank everybody for coming on the show and listening to us. And also we'd like to thank our sponsors for uh, burnoutpodcast.org. You can go there and see all of our sponsors. Turning Point Mass County is our our main sponsor today because we got somebody special guest here. There's a reason why that we talk about turning point Madison County and you can go to turning point and see what they do. We have our guest today. I've known him for a few years. He has came on board. I met him when I was the president of worldwide peer support and he came to the fire station. We got to talking and, and it it was off to the races in two or three years ago, I think. Uh, But we got Jason Howard on the show. Jason, welcome to the show. Well, Skip, thanks for having me and uh, great introduction there. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a few years. I'd say we go back probably about three, three plus years. Yeah, and, and for for us, we got we're, we're here in Mass County, Indiana. We probably knew of each other a long time ago just from different things. But uh, I really, I'm really grateful I got to know you and that you came on here. But could you, uh, you know, give a brief description of you know. What brought you today, like, for your missions? Well, I am the executive director of Turning Point Madison County, which we are a proud sponsor of the Burnout Podcast. Anything that Skip has his name attached to, you, uh, you're you always knowing it's going to be successful. So you've done a lot of great things out there. So we're just proud to be a part of, uh, proud to be a part of Burnout. Uh, hey, don't, don't stop talking. Keep talking about me. I there, like that there, stuff. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, so I am the executive director of Turning Point Madison County, and what we are is essentially a, a crisis resource management center for our substance abuse and mental health that's in our community. And we offer free services uh, provided through peer recovery coaching. Um, with that, we, uh, gosh, we just want to find people where they are that would otherwise be disregarded. And how do we meet people where they are in crisis? And when you're dealing in this uh, this demographic, we work a lot in our court systems. We work a lot in our jails, um, community corrections, um, and just a lot of outreach more than anything. But we operate a 24-7 uh, crisis phone number for anybody that just finds themselves in a need to, to just get assistance. Um, we have a wide range of things. With that, we also uh, were a part of the COST program, which is uh, another great thing that I've had the pleasure and uh, just really opportunity uh, to be able to set up and do for Madison County, which I'm delighted to say that uh, you are also a part of that um, and kind of seen that since the beginning. But uh, we're a secondary response uh, kind of product for our first responders. And uh, when you break it down, it really falls into some first responder deflection. But uh, we go out and assist with members that are in crisis. So you being a you being a fireman, um, you know, when we go out to the scenes on a call, we really just have two options uh, as first responders, and that's go to the hospital or go to jail. And a lot of times there are people that don't need either of those that we can find the leniency for. But how do we help them in the time of crisis where they are and also give our police who, you know, over the last few years have really taken a bad, bad beating in the media. How do we give them another tool to help deescalate a situation and not have to be that powerhouse and just be able to say, um, I can bring somebody else in to uh, provide that for you. Well, Jason, that sounds like a, I know it's a good program. I'm involved in it and I've seen it, seen the design of it and it, it's working here in Massa County and like other uh, counties around the United States, they do similar things. But Jason, that's what you do now. Yes. Uh, let's get to the juicy stuff. You know what I'm going for. <laughs> I do know. And let's get, and let's get to the Jason, not the Jason, the politician, the director of this. Let's get to the Jason, the paramedic, the hurt, the wounded Jason. That's where I want to go back to. If you don't mind, uh, take a glimpse in the past. Could you go there for us? Well, absolutely. As you said, I was a paramedic. I got started in EMS 
man, in high school, I, our uh, high school ran a uh, cadet program and kind of introduced you to it. But the funny thing is, as I look back on my childhood, I think I was always destined to uh, be in the health, you know, the medical field or really just EMS. So I got involved in this program and uh, through it, just fell in love with being on an ambulance. Uh, started seeing things at a very early age that uh, you don't really anticipate seeing or that the average person doesn't see. And through that, you know, didn't probably have the best foundation when it came to mental health to begin with. And so you start living a life uh, with that. And I was, uh, like I said, I was a paramedic, worked, uh, got to work multiple entities, ended up being a flight medic there at the end, and uh, just suffered through crisis in an identity of myself and really had an, uh, you know, mental health just, just went away. And, uh, we know when our mental health leaves us, we start chasing for other things and already having the traumas built on that. So I was one of those individuals that went to narcotics and we're better to find narcotics and have access to than on that ambulance. Um, and so, you know, 20 some years later, Life takes a big turn after you get into it and uh, you get a real quick wake up call. So when you, uh, you know, started turning to narcotics, Jason, where was the, um, the stop button? What, what was that thing that ha- either have you reached out or that gave you that light bulb? I need, I need to quit. I need some help. Um, when you start getting thoughts of, do I want to be alive anymore coming through your head? That's the biggest one. Uh, when you, when, when I stopped caring about what tomorrow was, um, it's just that state of depression that you find. And when you're untreated to begin with and don't necessarily think you have depressions or, you know, mental health aspects, um, you have to have a quick wake up call to it. And when you're dealing with what you're dealing with as a paramedic, um, you see that through people and you coach people through it and you try to help them. And then when it falls in your own personal lap, it gets tough. So, uh, I reached out and, uh, asked for help and it just didn't go the direction it needed to, which ultimately led me to where I am today and what I'm able to do. But, uh, you know, it's lessons learned through that. Well, I tell you, you know, like you said, it, it doesn't always go the way we think it should, but at the end of the day, we can look back. Okay. That's why it went like that. And, and you get, you get a acceptance thing of, you know, your past and different other things, but Jason, you weathered the storm through the mental health, you got some help. And then after that, what happened after you got help and going forward from there? Well, it's always a growth process. And you just can't say I went and talked to somebody and immediately I got healthy, kind of like you can. I just took, um, you know, I've got high cholesterol and I can take a pill and correct it and we're good. Um, Your mental health is something that you're always working on. You always need to grow. And that's a big thing we see in the recovery field. And and I do want to say, when I say recovery, everybody's recovering from something. We're all in recovery, and it's not just about substances. It's about mental health. It's about overcoming traumas, but you've constantly got to grow, and you've got to learn. Like Even today, I, I learned a major lesson before I came on the show with you just about myself and, and through that growth and the identity of things. So getting help was great. My life has changed You know, just once you accept it, everything changes for you, but you have to be willing to accept. You have to be willing to take the lumps. Um, it's not easy to, you know, to, to, to find what you need to, to truly move forward to a balanced and healthy lifestyle. Well, I tell you, Jason, I know for me, from hearing your story, your full story, it's, uh, you, you made a, I mean, the biggest change in the world and, and going to your peers now and, and rebuilding relationships there, it's working out too. For, uh, you know, we talk uh, about re- resiliency, you know, what's some other things that you do to keep going forward that keeps you peace of mind? What do you like doing and what what do you aspire to do in the future? Well, I'm going to stop you and say, what do you like doing? Because this got brought up to me again. Let's let's talk about growth. So even in, with my therapist, just, 
you know, a week or so ago. And it really resonated with me. And I kind of put this back out there because it held so much power to me. And it's so simple that I think everybody else has to look at it. Hold on a second. You're the Uh, director of Turning Point. You, You still see a therapist? You don't put a stop date on therapy. Um, if you do, you're done. Um, you're not going to get healthy. My therapist, and and we joke about it, it's probably the longest running relationship I've had with a person in my life. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing. And therapists are those issues where everybody needs one. I don't care if you think you have your life together, go at least once a month. There are things that you hold inside that you have to get out or it will eat you up. And it's little things sometimes, but everybody needs to go because once you open and you see that the stigma of mental health we've always had, um, it really changes that. And it, it, it will help you see through a different lens and maybe see a different perspective in things just through that. I tell you, you know, we all got stories from first responders where there was a run that really um, hurt us or whatever. And we won't, we'd never go into really detail. We don't want to trigger anybody. But is there certain runs of the past, and you don't have to tell me, that really resonate with you that you share with other first responders, kind of open the door for them to walk through for treatment? Yes and no. It's it's not necessarily the runs. And I think when we look at PTSD and we look at the trauma we experience, we get immune to what we see. It's the emotions that are in those runs. And that's what we really have to talk about because that's the part of the trauma that we carry um, that's so tough. And I remember probably the exact run that I broke on. And, you know, 22 years into a career, and I know well, I know the two runs and, and one of them was a significant one. And, and I can really get into it because you've got to understand that emotion that you carry. And again, I'd been a medic forever. I was filling in at a station. It was a couple of days before Christmas and we got a shooting and, uh, you know, you get the CAD system and it gives you all your information there. And so we get, as we're getting in the ambulance, I felt a fear that I'd never felt before and a fear of, oh my gosh, I'm going to, you know, what am I walking into and what am I going to have to control? Um, and, and, you know, you know that you come on a scene, you have seconds to, to, to size it up, to assess and then form a plan of attack. And so the whole time we're driving out to this run, I'm looking at the CAD and I'm just hoping somebody gets there and says, all I need to do is pronounce him. I don't want to work this. It's, you know, it's Christmas, blah, blah, blah. But the whole time I had this pit in my stomach where, and, and for first responders, they, they will understand that, you know, early in your career, this is one of those runs you're, you're getting excited about. It's, it's that trauma that everybody wanted to be in, but there was no excitement. And uh, so again, the whole time we're driving out there, it's, I'm, I want to pronounce him. I, I'm hoping that's all I'm doing is just come and pronounce and I, I don't have to get but uh, that wasn't it. So when we pull in, there was a uh, EMS captain from a volunteer department, and he meets me at the door, and he's like, he's still breathing. And uh, I just, I, I don't know, do you, you know what it's like to have just everything fall out of you, and you just feel lifeless standing there? And uh, it was truly that feeling. And and then to go in and here's uh, this guy on a bed in a bedroom. And, you know, we walk in a house and the house is full of people. It's chaos. It's screaming. It's crying. You can smell weed. Get in the bedroom and this kid's laying on top of bullets all over the floor. There's guns. And we had assault rifles. There's everything in this house. Um, And here's this kid with gray matter just all along the back of the wall. And... uh, Long story short, we got him to the ER and he, he had a stable, he was more stable than I was with his vitals. He was fixed and dilated 45 to the head, but it was through even that whole thing. It was the, just the, the being scared, being that everybody's going to look at me to fix this situation. I just, it's, it had been a long time since I'd felt that. And I knew right then that this isn't good. I can't keep going like this, that if I'm going to be more scared, how am I going to be able to truly do my job? Well, I tell you, Jason, that that's a, you're right. Talking about the motions of the runs or everyday life, but 
you've been out and you could tell how many years have you been out? And then does some of those runs bounce back every once in a while to you? You get triggered at all in any of those? I took my last run May 16th, 2018. So it's been five years and you always, I can't drive through my area without seeing some place that there was a run that I went on or there's some memory of something. And it's really, you know, through therapy, you, you learn how to process these things better, but it doesn't change. It's always going to be there. It's just how do you react to it now? Sure. I can relate. Just, you know, I live in a, in a town that I grew up in and, you know, 33 years being on the job, there's not a street, uh, you know, everything went out and it'll pop up, you know, oh, I've been there because of this or that. And they're not always bad runs. Some of them are, real, some of them are good runs or we did some good stuff. Well, and there's times I can drive by a house and kind of giggle because it's that it, it wasn't a trauma. Nobody was really hurt, but there was something comical that you had to go deal with that was there. So you have good and bad when you do that, but most of the times the good, you don't get as much good as you do bad. Yeah, you're right there. And I bet everybody that's listening, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, firefighters, EMS, uh, but also military police officers. We... When you talk about motion, emotions, that covers everything for, for first responders or everyday people. Because some people, you know, they, they live at home and, that you know, that we deal with in our job in Turning Point. And we go check on them and it's like a war zone going to that house. Have, have you had a lot of experience that since you started this program? To be able to do all this, I'm blessed because of my EMS career. Um, nothing really blindsides me when I go into a house anymore, but I see that I go in with more compassion and empathy now than maybe I did before. And people get in situations and, and it gets over their heads. So it's great that we have resources like Turning Point to be able to go in there and try to provide that and help lift them up. But uh, yeah, you still see it. There's blight everywhere. And um, the best we can do is, is see what we can do to get people to be the best they can be tomorrow. Absolutely. I know, uh, you know, for our county, Turning Point Massive County helps our county, but you know, for the Worldwide Peer Support, if you go to worldwidepeersupport.org, we're here for any first responder in the United States if you need any help. We got Zoom meetings Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern. So jump on that website, worldwidepeersupport.org, or you can go to burntoutpodcast.org and you can click on the link there. It'll take you to the website. So I just wanted to plug that because we're talking about a county in Indiana, but Worldwide Peer Support and Jason uh, is a part of that uh, too. He just didn't, uh, he, he knows it, but you know, I can call on him when I need him to talk to somebody from England. He's done that before on Thanksgiving day morning. Do you remember that? I absolutely do. And, and the great thing is, so I'm going to give you some accolades here, Skip, because a lot of the stuff that I've been able to be successful in, especially in the last three years of my life, since meeting you, let's just put it there. I think there was just a natural drive in both of us of what we do that everything I've been successful in, you've had a piece in somewhere or you're still a part of, or, or there's something with that. And it's that drive, that understanding and that connection that we're able to have to know what others are doing. Because, you know, I, I started the uh, Warriors Pathway to Recovery, which is a first responder program for Bridges of Hope here in Madison County. But to keep that program maintained, it couldn't happen without the worldwide peer support. So to have you guys go in there, and that's a key component to what that program is to to, to help our first responders and military victims. And, and first responders, we have to look at being nurses and corrections officers and and um, our dispatchers, you know, everybody that's in this, we all suffer from it. It's just different traumas. With that, I just say that, Skip, you, you know, you have been a driving force to me and, and keep me moving forward. You deserve, you know, a hat off to yourself even and, and what you do. But uh, I go back and, and, and we got into this conversation just yesterday and, uh, you know, you'd asked, what, what do I do that I enjoy? But it comes back to what do you do that makes you just happy. What are the things that make you happy? Not that you want or anything like that, but what is that that you do? You know, one thing that I like doing that uh, that gives me peace is is kind of crazy. I like uh, uh, I keep bees. Me and my wife were were beekeepers, and we go play around with the bees. And I don't wear a suit anymore. I quit doing that because I want to live on the edge. Uh, just. <laughs> 
It's but, still that firefighter side. But, you know, we we keep bees. We go out in the backyard and set up like we've got a camper back there. And I like mowing the yard now. I never would like that, but I like going out there. It's peaceful, mow the yard. And you can look back and you, something's done. Something's finished for now. And then, you know, I love, uh, you know, going out in the woods. And, my ther- and I still see a therapist and I'm, I'm going to for a while. And Absolutely. She, she told me, Skip, go for a walk, shut your phone off, leave it in your car for an hour or a half hour. Or she said an hour and then just get lost in the woods. And that's what I do down in Tennessee. When I go uh, down there, I just uh, put my, there's no service that helps me out the best because there's no service. We talked about this yesterday, um, but I can get, go up in the mountains and get lost and, and just get lost in my thoughts and enjoy nature and that. And spending time with my wife today is a, a joyful thing. Used to, it wasn't like that because I was drinking and drugging and hiding and lying and all that good stuff, bad stuff. But now right. I like spending, I like spending time with her. She and my family, my grandkids, that's enjoyable to me. That's something I like. And I love seeing guys and ladies that I work with in recovery, see their life change. And I get to, I get to see like a movie. I, in this movie it's got a lot of good innings, got a lot of sad innings, but I get to see people's lives change, go a 180, 180 and see them help other people. Man, that's joy to my heart that I've been a small part of somebody's life that I can help them because I got a whole lot of people that's helped me. And that's a team, just like the worldwide peer support has board members, has other people that runs that. It's not just me. It takes a team to make this machine work. And that's called life. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I bring up that, you know, we had that conversation yesterday and that brings me to a realization that I had today that my phone owns me. And so, you know, to hear you say that, that here I am re- in recovery, I work with people, I try to give them advice. And just yesterday in a simple conversation that we were going back and forth, I learned something from you and actually was able to, you know, put that into process today. And I spent two hours just laying out phone off, not worrying about it. And it was a great two hours, but it brought me back to why can I not do that? Why does that own me? And, and that's that emotion of always being on call, always being at the ready that all our first responders still carry. And, and it's, you know, being on that knife's edge that, okay, we got to walk away from that. (laughs) You're right. I tell you, it's, um, I'm enjoying life a lot more. Not saying I have my crash moments. So I was telling you the other day, and I was telling people I had a little plumbing leak, and I, it's leaking a little bit. I went and tried to fix it. Went to the uh, low. Went to the store three times to get the right part. Didn't get the right one. wasn't paying attention. Came back. The world's done. I'm ready to quit my job with Jason. I don't want to work with Jason. I'm ready to give up the worldwide peer support. Be done with all of that. I'm ready. And then all of a sudden, I got it right. Got the plumbing fixed, and everything else was good. <laughs> yep. I got that one small thing done. The life was good again. Not you know, and all the other situations I got in my life. That was I was focused on this one problem, but it wasn't that one thing that was causing the conflict. It was unresolved issues from these other things. I just had a moment. And I got to remember those moments will pass. But everybody has those. And, and that's the thing that we've all got to look at. And, and that's what makes you and I, um, you know, I, I want to say we're on a healthy balance. I don't know if I'm going to say we're healthy by any means, but it's when you recognize those and, and what that reaction is. But yeah, I, uh, the worst thing in the world I've always said is I never want to act out of emotion because I always know I'm going to be wrong. But it's tough to take step backs like that and um, not what to say. I'm done. I'm out of it. <laughs> I'm grateful for, for a lot of people in my life that have patience and tolerance for me. You know, that that's knows I get passionate or call it angry or that can knows that's not me. That's the... the that's the darkness. That's just the anxiety that's talking. And then it, when I take that break and I can relax catch my breath, and then I can come back into whatever I'm talking to or whatever I'm dealing with. Now, I want to ask you a question. You kind of brought something up and it made me think about it, and I don't know if it was before or just now, but you went to the Center of Excellence in 2018, correct? Um, actually, it's 2020. 2020. Okay. And you didn't retire until when? I retired a year and a half ago, so I was on for, I think, two years after I retired or after I left through the Center. Something that when we talk to our first responders, I I hear a lot of, and that is 
do I stay in this field? Do I recover to where I continue to do it again? Or am I done if I have to seek out help? And I know your story and I know your background. And and so I don't think I've ever actually asked you this before, but after going and knowing what led up to get into the center of excellence, going to the center of excellence, how hard was it to transition back for those last couple of years and do you think that affected your decision to retire? No, not me. I My captain would always tell me I was done 10 years before I retired. But, you know, for, for me, you know, being a firefighter was the only thing I thought I was good at. And going back, I was fortunate enough in our department that I had so much support. Um, it was in the station I was working at. Those guys supported me. We're like family. And, uh, going back in, it wasn't that bad. I, you know, I was counting the days that I retired, but I didn't leave the job because I was angry. I didn't leave the job because I was just, it was, it was my time to turn that chapter and do something different because 33 years on a job, getting up at all times in the morning and being on the, seeing people not at their best, man, it takes a toll on you. So I know a lot of people that are newly in recovery, been on four or five years, they're kind of adjusting and say, is this the life for me? I think don't do that knee jerk reaction. Give it some time. If you got that luxury of having time to think about it. And if you're, if you um, believe in something, uh, pray about it, talk to some people outside the situation to get a more informed decision that will be honest with you. I think that's the way. And that's what I did. I I talked to uh, people that's in recovery, my wife, my pastor and uh, a lot of people, a lot of other first responders that helped me form that decision. Now, when you came back and you started, you know, you started back at it again, did you look at the job differently? Yeah, I, I think I did. I know I thought the joke around it, uh, a group of people that I'm around all the time, they said, Skip, just go get help. We know you need it. You, the world's not going to shut down. That was March of 2020. Guess what? The world shut down. <laughs> <laughs> that's our that's our joke we talk about. But no, with me, I, I tell you, the job it helped me practice patience, gave me gave me tools how to handle those trauma runs and how to handle the past triggers and stuff. You no, know, the job was the job was easier when I got back because I knew between my ears how to handle it. And I knew what I needed to do is be honest about my emotions. Like we talked earlier to other people, my crew and, right. uh, and just be, and that helped me out the most. Now, how was the reception from, and, and, you know, it's your brothers it's your station, you, you 33 years with these guys, but how do you truly feel they received you? And, Do you feel they leaned on you a little bit to maybe help them um, help them navigate and see some things through that process? Yeah, for me, it's been like that for a little while. This simply because I've been in recovery for 23 years and and a lot of people has done that. But, yeah, I'm real open about who I am and what happened to me. And then when you got when you're at 11 o'clock at night and you're sitting with one of your guys, young guys, they open up to you more when not everybody's around. And then I don't tell them what to do. I said, well, here's what I did. And I give them information, but yeah, they open up to me more, but also I still got the hot head. I still got that character defect Raymond, right there. And they know how to, my captain then, thank God we both hot head. He stood up to me, even though he stood up to about five foot, he stood up to me, <laughs> but he was a Iraq war vet twice. So I, I don't have nothing on him. He was very good and honest with me about stuff. So I was grateful for that, but let me, let me 180 this around to you now. Jason, somebody is out there, a first responder, police, military, fire, emergency person, EMS. They're right there listening to this podcast, driving in their car, or they're in their one-room apartment. They got a bottle of pills or alcohol, and they're thinking, man, it ain't worth being here anymore. What are you going to do? What are you going to tell them? There's help out there. Tomorrow's a new day. Next week's a new week. Next month is a new month. And there is always a tomorrow that it's not worth it. Um, we've all suffered through it. We all know what you're dealing with. And uh, you go. You got to get help and get better. And there's a life outside of EMS. There's a life outside of the career that you are. And a lot of times when we hear the individuals that are in this, it's not that they work the job. They are the job. Well, like you said, the world will go on and so will your life. Look at both of us. 
I suffered through the crisis of it. I suffered through the identity and I'm in such a better place in my life now than I was when I thought I was the happiest professionally. So you just have to jump over the hurdle, climb through the door and know that there are people there to help you. And tomorrow is a new day. All right, Jason, thank you for that. And also, what is a, a comment or a quote that resonates through your mind or heart when you're going through a tough time that gives you that drive to keep pushing on? We must first understand before being understood. We must first understand then to be understood. Before being understood. Jason, thank you for being on the show. We thank everybody for listening to us. And if you need any help, you can go to worldwidepeersupport.org. Three support Zoom meetings, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Go to burnoutpodcast.org, burntoutpodcast.org, and message us if you need any help or if you'd like to be a guest on this show. For now, everybody, go home, shut your phone off, and get some rest. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Burnout. Burnout is brought to you by the Worldwide Peer Support. You can visit Burnout Podcast at burntoutpodcast.org or visit Worldwide Peer Support at worldwidepeersupport.org. Your hosts for the Burnt Out Podcast are Skip O and Jeff the Old Guy. Produced by Sean P. Neal. A mypodcast.media production.